Hello everyone, welcome back to Reading in Isolation. I'm Heather Rose and we're reading Finding Serendipity. We are so close to the end. We're up to chapter 21. And as you know, Mothwood has challenged Tuesday to a duel of rhyming couplets. Now you might remember also that Tuesday does a lot of this with her dad. So she's a little bit more prepared than Mothwood might think. But nevertheless, it's Carsten Mothwood back from the dead and he's truly terrifying and the stakes are very high, aren't they? This is for Tuesday's life, for Vivian's life and for Baxter's freedom. So this is a big stakes game. And the, to the coin has been tossed by Mothwood. Lion called Tuesday. Mothwood lurched to catch the coin, but it slipped through his fingers. Before the coin could hit the deck, Gum caught it and whacked it down on the back of one of his huge hands. Lion it is, Cap'n, he, gr he growled. The girl starts. Gum reluctantly placed the coin back in Tuesday's palm. Then he ambled to the mast, where amid the many notches and scores from previous duels, he marked the timber with his knife, drawing a line across and a line down. At the top of one column, he carved the letter M, and at the top of the other column, the letter X. All Mothwood's opponents were given the same letter, and so the mast was covered in many M's and many X's, but not once had the score in the X column exceeded the score in Mothwood's. Now chain them, Mothwood said, and Flem grabbed Baxter and Vivian. No, said Tuesday. I'll have no distractions, Mothwood added coldly. Tuesday watched helplessly as Vivian and Baxter were chained together beneath the scoreboard on the main mast. Well, get on with it, girl, said Mothwood. They'll be free soon enough if you win. Then first the rules, said Tuesday, breathing deeply. A pair of couplets makes a turn. No half rhymes. Agreed? Agreed, said Mothwood. Right then, said Tuesday. My first topic is family. Her gaze meeting Mothwood's, she said. My mother is Sarah. My father is Dennis. They often play bridge, but they seldom play tennis. From Monday to Sunday, they work and they play, but what they love best is a girl called Tuesday. Tuesday's voice faltered at the thought of her parents, but the rhyme was good. Mothwood's men gave a sentimental ooh at this, and Mothwood sent them a withering glare. With his knife, Gum made a mark in the X column. Mothwood turned his one good eye to Tuesday, while the other eye swivelled about as if following a passing seagull. Time, he announced, and then he began. Through life you are gripped by time with her claws, but at the moment of death you'll find when it's yours that time has let go, that at last you are free, but there's nowhere to go, nothing to see. Mothwood's men applauded and Gum swiftly notched up a point for the captain. Tuesday suspected that Mothwood had known this pair of rhyming couplets a long time and that he hadn't made it up on the spot at all. It seemed rather like cheating to Tuesday, but if that was his gain, then two could play it. Tuesday took a deep breath, planning to hit Mothwood with one of her old favourites, but her mind drew a blank. Each and every one of her favourite couplets had suddenly abandoned her. Well, Mothwood said, cat got your tongue. He poked out his own tongue and breathed at her. The stench was so shocking that Tuesday said the first thing that came into her head. Food. Uh, figs are delicious with soft cheese and ham. Toast is quite scrumptious with butter and jam. Eggs are improved by parsley and salt but milkshakes are best with strawberries and malt. Arr, said the pirates hungrily. A few of them whistled in approval. Gum put a second knife mark in Tuesday's column. Everyone's gaze turned again to Mothwood. Girls, he said with a sneer. 
I know several sharks who have eaten small girls, from the tips of their toes to the ends of their curls. Did you know they scream loudest when their eyeballs are chewed? Especially, I'm told, when those eyeballs are blue. Ha! Blue and chewed, they don't rhyme. That's a half rhyme at best, said Tuesday triumphantly. You fail, Mothwood. Mothwood's face reddened, which was quite a spectacular sight, on top of the deathly white sheen of his cheeks. It was good, he screeched. It was good. He turned to his men. Gum deliberated with the men, and then he said, We say it was good, Captain. And all the men roared out their agreement. It was good. It had become clear to Tuesday that the pirates would cheat and lie and do all that was necessary to ensure that their captain was victorious. But there was nothing she could do except take her next turn. She must not lose to Mothwood. She must beat him at all costs. Well, what paltry efforts will your puny mind come up with next? And please don't bore me with another simpering one about your family, he said in a jeering tone. The spectre of him was growing more ghastly by the minute. Mothwood loomed in front of her. Sweat had broken out on his forehead and both his eyes were weeping and bloodshot. Tuesday's palms were sweating and she felt lightheaded. She struggled to think of anything in reply. Vivian gazed at her with a steady expression. Baxter dropped his head onto his paws. Everything began to swirl in front of Tuesday. Vivian, Baxter, phlegm, gum, stick, liver, the sun blinding her eyes, the lift and fall of the ship as it sailed on. Then Tuesday focused on Mothwood. Mothwood, she announced. Your head is on crooked, your body's decaying, the legs you once walked on are twisted and swaying. You can't feel the sunshine for cold bite of frost. You may have fled death, but your life is still lost. Mothwood slumped against the mast and chortled. Really? He said, I think I'm doing rather well. With this, he did a truly terrible thing. He swiveled his head all the way around until it was at last in its correct place. Both his eyes looked straight ahead. He smiled and took a small bow. This had an unsettling effect on everyone, especially Mothwood's men. They shifted uncertainly and would not look at one another. A chill crept over the deck. Mothwood spoke, breaking the spell for a moment, and his voice was quiet and menacing. Lost, he announced. She will never again sleep gently at night. She will dread when the m she must extinguish the light. Every day she will flinch at memories cruel of a dog she once loved and lost in a duel. Oof, this was a nasty trick. Fear crept along Tuesday's skin. A cold shudder of doubt ran through her whole body. She saw again that fragile beginning of a book by Tuesday McGillicuddy with the words on the cover changing from finding to losing. She couldn't do it. She looked at Baxter and realised that Mothwood was right. She would lose him. She looked at Vivian and imagined she was clearly expecting Tuesday to lose at any moment. Mothwood would lash Vivian to the bow sprit of the silverfish to become its figurehead. And Vivian would die there. Baxter would become Mothwood's dog. Tuesday would never escape. Mothwood would ensure that she died a grim and horrible death, the most horrible he could imagine. At this last thought, Tuesday started out of her reverie. Imagine, imagine this was her only chance. If this didn't work, she was lost. They were all lost. She took a deep breath and closed her eyes. In a clear voice, she said, warning. I should warn you my dog is about to take flight. 
He will break through your chains and before you can fight, he'll have rescued his friends, will be laughing and free. You'll never best Vivian, my winged dog and me. As she uttered the last words, Tuesday threw her arms in the air dramatically as if casting a spell. She heard something fall to the deck and with a chill watched as her ball of thread dislodged from her pocket with the flourish of her arms and it went rolling along the deck of the silverfish towards Mothwood. Tuesday lunged after it, but Mothwood made one sweep with his long arm and grasped the silver ball of thread in his hand. Hmm, he said quietly, precious is it? Tuesday's shock ran across her face. Yes, she said before she could bite back the word and pretend the thread was of no worth at all. Mothwood's eyes gleamed. Choices, he said, teasing out a loose end of thread with his long fingers. And then his voice filled with scornful pleasure and he began. You think you can win, but already it's done. The game is all over. You've lost and I've won. A choice must be made, not with he heart, but with head. So what will it be now? your dog or your thread. Mothwood held the ball out towards Tuesday. That's mine, she said. That wasn't part of the game. Oh, not part of the game. Oh, Mothwood doesn't play fair, he said in a whiny tone. His men snickered. Tuesday shrugged. It's just a ball of string, she said calmly. It's not important. She hoped Mothwood would believe her bluff. She knew there was no way she and Baxter could get home without it. Oh, well then, he said, if it doesn't matter, I'll just toss it overboard. He lurched towards the railing. Are you sure it doesn't matter? He asked, looking back at her. Yes, said Tuesday, her jaw clenched. And then she relaxed. Yes, she said again. I'm quite sure it doesn't matter. And in that moment, she suddenly and absolutely believed that everything would be all right. If he threw the, book, the thread overboard, she might never get home. She might have to stay here in this strange land forever, but she would never abandon Baxter and Vivian, not for anything in the world. Let's see if you truly mean that, Mothwood said. Mustering all his strength, Mothwood heaved the silver ball out over the ocean. It flew in a high arc, but instead of falling, it continued to rise. It soared upwards high above the ship, twinkling and glittering. It was going much further and higher than Mothwood's ungainly throw could possibly have propelled it. Everyone on board was transfixed by this strange phenomenon. And then, as if the chains holding him and Vivian were made of nothing more than paper mache, Baxter broke free and took off after the ball of thread. As she watched him go, Tuesday was reminded of Baxter in City Park, leaping after a spinning frisbee thrown high in the air. But this time Baxter had no need to come down again. He spread his wings and flew up and up and up. Tuesday lost sight of the thread behind the looming shape of Baxter, though he was going further and further away from her. At the same time, he seemed to be taking up more of the sky. This made no sense. Tuesday watched transfixed as Baxter banked and began to fly back towards the ship. But this wasn't her dog. This was an enormous dog. Truly, Baxter's wingspan was wide enough to match a glider's. His body was as big as a truck. His enormous legs were tucked up underneath him, and he had a smile from ear to ear. Baxter glided over the ship, barking once. The boat quivered with the sound, and the men ducked for cover. Now, Vivian called. She grasped Tuesday's hand and pulled her towards the mast. The pirates, 
transfixed by the sight of Baxter, was slow to react. Up and up the ladder, Tuesday and Vivian climbed. The men below did their best to pursue them, but the girls were faster. As the crow's at the crow's nest, they scrambled onto the narrow railing. Phlegm and liver were gaining on them. Jump, Vivian yelled, grabbing fast to Tuesday's hand. And without being sure what was happening, only knowing she had to trust Vivian, who always knew how to get herself out of any predicament, Tuesday jumped with Vivian into nothingness. She saw the sea below her, the sun sparkling on the water, and then a great golden brown dog appeared beneath them and whoosh, she landed in a soft, warm pile of fur. Grab on, Vivian called. Tuesday gripped the fur for all her might as Baxter climbed up into the air and swooped away, holding Tuesday's ball of thread gently in his mouth. He circled once more over the silverfish. Tuesday had a last glimpse of the pirate standing awestruck on the deck and Mothwood screeching something incomprehensible before Baxter swept them away over the vast rippling ocean. I'll see you back for chapter 22. Bye for now.